everybody for being here despite the thunder and lightning. Um, which I encountered on the well, mic. We can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> is going to demonstrate some of the issues that historical linguists need to deal with when they're using data from written sources. And a particular issue I'm going to look at is what linguistic meaning, if any, does the dot here have over the old Cyrillic letter that's called Pitsi, which represents the consonant R in Slavic. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because I'm uh, producing an edition of a particular 13th century uh, Bulgarian manuscript that's written in Bulgarian Church Slavonic. There has been an edition of it from 1906 that didn't include any diacritics. In fact, it's not a very good edition where there are a number of things that are wrong with the uh, transcription. And I found that when I was working on a related manuscript to this one, which I also published an edition of. And so then I decided I really need, having worked with the actual manuscript, put out the corrected edition. But then I discovered a number of things, such as the dot over the R occasionally, which the first edition hadn't mentioned, and I had to deal with in my writing um, uh, an introduction and an analysis of the linguistic features and the orthographic and paleographic features of the uh, manuscript. Because even if you're trying to do a linguistic uh, analysis, if you're dealing with a manuscript, you still have to deal with things like the orthography and the handwriting, what is orthographic in the handwriting, what isn't, etc., in addition to uh, the um, purely uh, linguistic issues. Um, and trying to figure out what this means uh, is particularly challenging because the diacritic over this letter occurs only very sporadically in the manuscript. But it's not a place where you would usually have a dot. You usually don't have them over consonant letters. Um, you have them over um, uh, vowel letters uh, in many manuscripts. And I'll show you what I mean in a moment on another slide. But just about the uh, manuscript in general, um, it's in Bulgarian Church Slavonic, which is a later version of Old Church Slavonic. Um, and it, the difference is that Bulgarian Church Slavonic reflects some phonological and morphological features of the vernacular language, which is Middle Bulgarian. There was nothing written in Middle Bulgarian, so that's why we look at so-called mistakes, etc., in the ultra-Slavonic and later manuscripts that um, show these, um, uh, accidentally, in most, most cases, show these vernacular features. Um, the other two similar major descendants of ultra-Slavonic are Serbian, Tur-Slavonic, and Russian Tur-Slavonic. Um, the Manuscript is from Western Bulgaria, and this is clear from certain phonological dialect features that are reflected in its orthography. Several scribes have contributed to this manuscript, which isn't unusual. Um, you would have people trying to finish a manuscript, so one might be away and someone else would step in for a while. Uh, but the primary one was named Priest Dobresho, and that's why it's called the Dobresho Gospel. So how do we know that his name is um, Priest Dobresho? because he put a self-portrait of himself into one of the four full-page illustrations to each of the four gospel books that is a portrait of the uh, evangelist, and he labeled himself with his name in the picture. <laughs> okay, so this is the um, uh, catalog number of the manuscript. It's um, kept at the National Library in Sofia, um, uh, Bulgaria. So today, as so I indicated, I'm going to focus just on one you know, small issue. There are a lot of issues with this manuscript, but on the diacritics that sporadically appear over the letter C, again, which is the name of the letter. These are sometimes dots, and sometimes they look more like acute accents, but they're not accentuation markers because their placement doesn't correspond to the actual syllable stress in the words they appear in. And the manuscript, unlike a lot of um, medieval Slavic manuscripts, doesn't mark stress with accent marks. Anyway, it doesn't normally use accent marks. Um, an important thing to note that although the primary scribe is Dobresho, the both the Western orthographic uh, features of the manuscript and these marks over the letter of C may not have been initiated by him. He may have simply copied them from his source, in other words, from the manuscript that he was copying from. And this is something you have to be careful with when you're dealing with data from written text. In um, 
Manuscripts, dialect forms, and even inadvertent spellings and uh, accidental omissions of text, etc., can be copied by generations of scribes who are just kind of blindly copying, so that they end up in generations and generations of later manuscripts. So that means that a manuscript, it's quite common for a manuscript to contain many chronological levels of phonological and morphological innovations, some possibly dating back a century or more. And as a clear example of this um, in the Gibraltar Gospel, um, the manuscript contains several Macedonianisms. And in particular, the spelling of uh, an altered Slavonic back reduced vowel as O, okay, instead of as the reduced vowel, which you know, I don't know how it was, it was pronounced exactly, but something like a schwa, okay, in a syllable that was followed by another reduced vowel in the next syllable. So in Macedonian, in fact, even in contemporary standard Macedonian, now in this position, the reduced vowel lowers to O. In other Slavic languages, it does other things, okay? But it doesn't do that in Bulgarian, and so that's how we know that these are Macedonianisms. Um, in uh, Western Bulgarian manuscripts, um, in, in Western Bulgarian dialects, as opposed to Macedonian ones, so that obviously there's a lot of overlap, the back uh, reduced vowel stays as it is because Bulgarian just kept that sound and that's the sound that you have in the name Bulgaria. Oh, okay. It's actually Bulgarian, a Bulgaria in Russian. It's the only Slavic language that has that schma uh, sound, whether it's stressed or not. So okay, so if we're saying an O oh, instead of an O uh, uh, in a Bulgarian manuscript, that means it's Macedonian influence. It, that uh, either the scribe was, had spoken Macedonian dialect, or maybe it was copied from a Macedonian uh, manuscript, or whatever. And so how do we know that priest Dobratio didn't make these slips himself and write these sporadic O's instead of the reduced vowel? Well, because we're lucky to have the evidence to find this out, because usually we don't, these same Macedonianisms, the O for A, uh, occur in exactly the same words and in exactly the same places in the text in two later 14th century Western Bulgarian manuscripts that are clearly related on a, in terms of textual features, etc., to the Debrecia Gospel. And it's clear that neither of them was copied from the Debrecia Gospel because the Debrecia has some errors and omissions in the text that they don't share with it, so it must have been copied from something else. So that means that these Macedonianisms were already present in the copying source for the scribe, the priest of Debrecia, and probably in the source for that copying source, and so on. Um, so that they are not features of this scribe, and if we're going to talk about what the, um, uh, Debrecia's vernacular dialect look like, we can't include them. I mean, but again, we're lucky that we can compare this with two other manuscripts, because usually you can't, but there are no other manuscripts left that are related. In fact, these three manuscripts with the Debrecia constitute the only family of uh, Bulgarian gospel, medieval uh, Bulgarian gospel manuscripts. So these are the only ones that you can actually compare this way. Um, so by comparing their phonological features, um, we can help uh, tease out the different dialects that are reflected in the prehistory of the manuscript. So here I will show you what I'm talking about with the dots, although I don't actually have a dot over a word on this page, but I chose this page because it had a nice uh, picture on it. <laughs> so this is a, uh, uh, a page that was um, written by or copied by um, Dobrecio. And to start off with, we need to know something about the general types of superscript diacritical marks that are common in many of Slavic manuscripts and what their function is. So this page, or this portion of the page, can serve as an example of several different types of diacritics. So, kind of hard to see here, but if you can tell, there's actually more than one diacritic type here that in a lot of places we see a dot, sometimes it looks like an apostrophe, et cetera. But these are all the same, sort of like uh, allophones, these are alloorths, I guess you would say, for orthography. <laughs> or someone was writing quickly and not being too careful. Sometimes we have two, okay? And actually, and then also we have sometimes this horizontal line. Okay, so all of these are quite common and they're not anything really to, um, uh, anything remarkable. And, um, uh, medieval Slavic manuscripts. The dot typically occurs over the first vowel, uh, uh, over a word initial vowel letter, or if there are two vowel letters in a row in a word, it's also over the second of these. 
Um, as you might notice, if you ignore the periods, which are actually not really periods, they also can serve as commas or as semicolons, etc. Okay. Other than that, actually, there were no spaces between the words, okay, except for when we reached the end of a clause or whatever. So by doing this, it was uh, kind of a reader-friendly way of marking sometimes where the beginning of the word was, but generally because um, uh, Slavic does not generally have diphthongs. Um, if you saw two vowel letters in a row, you might wonder like what was going on here, and that's why um, they would have this marking. Also, certain types of um, uh, letter forms for the yotated um, vowels, this would be pronounced U, have this kind of vertical bar, what we call a ligature. Um, and it's just a convention, here's another one in this manuscript, this is U, this is Ya, to put two dots over it to indicate it's one of those yotated um, uh, letters coming up. I mean, there's not any reason why you would have to have it. Many um, uh, manuscripts don't of this period, but it's not unusual to do that. And then finally, these lines over here show that the word is an abbreviation. Okay? I mean, they're interested in saving space because they are dealing with parchment, and so um, you know your manuscript could be like this big. So you're going to try to save the um, number of folios that you have, etc., by um, uh, abbreviating words. And there are particular words that tend to get abbreviated because they were abbreviated in Greek, and these are all translations from Greek. Okay, um, like this, the word uh, Jesus, for example, which here is e s a. Because it's considered one of the nomina sacra, or sacred names, in Greek manuscripts it was abbreviated kind of as a symbol. But then what happened is also some other words got abbreviated too that were long, so forms of the, um, uh, the verb to speak, which isn't particularly a um, sacred uh, word like here, would also get abbreviated. So all that means is that, um, just to make it easier for you to read this, that this is an abbreviation, we don't have all the letters in here. Also in red, these are the liturgical rubrics that tell you when this um, gospel lesson is written in the church calendar year. So this says it's for Tuesday, and Tuesday is also abbreviated because why would you want to write out Tuesday each time, okay? Here also, if we have two dots on either side and a T flow over the top, that's a numeral because um, this is in Greek, in uh, Cyrillic, they used uh, alphabet letters as numerals, and so to make it easier for you to read, that this really was meant to be the numeral and not a word, you put a t-law, but then it would look like maybe an abbreviation, so it's, not everyone does this, but it's pretty frequent to put dots on either side, so you know right away, number, okay? Um, okay, so, and then, um, right. So also the reason for putting the dot or whatever, this one looks more like a, um, a kind of apostrophe or a, um, um, or a quote mark. Part of the reason for putting these um, on word initial uh, vowel letters is because Greek did that. And Greek manuscripts did that. And so we had to do that too. But in Greek manuscripts, there was actually a linguistic reason for doing that, which was that some manuscripts would be pronounced with uh, smooth breathing, and others would be pronounced with aspiration for them. And so actually, if you had something that looked like this, a backwards apostrophe, it meant it would be pronounced with aspiration. You don't have aspiration um, before vowels in um, Slavic, so this is just, it just also ends up being kind of decorative. Another thing is that most um, manuscripts do have add accent marks, but they just do it for decoration, so that, because Greek manuscripts do that too. So, I mean, sometimes it actually does um, show you how some of these words are pronounced, but usually it's like, oh, let's see, let's put these, you know, breathing marks in it because they don't look like more important. So, yeah. So, luckily, this manuscript actually doesn't do that, but it does do something kind of superfluous by putting the dots here. Some manuscripts don't even do these dots over the first, um, the word initial letters, um, but that's really not very common. Okay, so then just so you can get more of a feel of this manuscript before I actually look at the Udra. Here's some of Priest Obratio's handiwork. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Oh, back here, right, the picture, right. This is also 
characteristic of manuscripts that um, were meant to be kind of more formal and maybe not just used to read in your study or something, but um, meant to be attractive. And, have, and notice that I mentioned I had illustrations. And Dobrysha drew these too. This is what's called a teratological um, uh, letter or figure. As where it was not unusual to have some sort of an imaginary animal, they're usually imaginary animals, that was formed out of the shape of a majuscule or a capital letter that started off the gospel lesson. So I don't know if you can tell what letter this is supposed to be, because often they're very <laughs> ornate, okay? And they have what's called Balkan braiding, which was all this kind of like Escher type stuff in it, which was very common in South Slavic manuscripts. But this actually, if I trace it, there's this, and then there's this. It would be what was a B in English, but a V in um, altered Slavonic because the textual formula for the beginning, or one of them for the beginning of a gospel text is at that time, and at is V plus the reduced vowel. Okay. And then these things here tell you the chapter number where you are, and because this is a, this is not a lectionary, which gives you each of the lections separately. It just is the whole narrative, you know, starting whole way through uh, chapter one through whatever twenty three or whatever. Um, and so, if you want to know where you are? That's the chapter number there. You can see the dots, which shows that this is a number. Okay. So now on to right. Christo Bracio's handiwork. Heard some flowers and seemed to be Olympic rings also here. <laughs> <laughs> this is before um, a list of, um, of um, prayers um, that could be used on different occasions. That was also very common, that was a very standard text. But he has labeled this the top two because he's often afraid that you might not be able to figure out what it was that he drew. And at the top, which is kind of cut off here, um, it says, this is paradise, also known as heaven. Right? So if you ever want to know what it looked like there, it looks like this. So. <laughs> okay. And so then here, how we know about um, uh, the ratio being the scribe, here is his um, uh, drawing, uh, illustration of St. John the Evangelist, the writer of the book of John. And here he is, um, and that's John, of course. And couldn't fit, unfortunately. I haven't ever yet figured out how to do this to get the entire picture onto the PowerPoint slide, so I have to show you it in two parts. So here's the bottom, but here he has his name, and this says, um, Priest of Brescia praying to St. John. Okay. So, all right. And then he also mentions his name in other places so that we know that he did not um, draw this for a donor or something named um, De Brescia. This is actually him. And then just one of the others. This is the... Um, Portrait of St. Luke, just to also show you. He, you have these things hanging down here, and up above it, it says, these are grapes and um, lamps, like candle lamps, because these are kind of typical. You can see them in um, Eastern Orthodox churches even now, where you would have like a candle in the middle, and right. so in case you didn't know what that was. Okay. And then this part on the side here, the marginalia, or the margin note, says, right margin says, I hope I do a better job drawing St. John. <laughs> okay. John was his <laughs> Okay. So, in any event, there are four idiosyncratic diacritic patterns that I had to deal with in the Debre Show Gospel, but I'm only going to talk about this one today. So, okay. Then, again, I, what I, this is a dot, or something that might look like an accent mark, or apostrophe, or whatever, generally over or near the ritzi in the letter, because um, scribes would generally add the dots after they wrote the word, so they kind of <coughs> add them haphazardly, and they might end up over another letter. So here's an example where it actually ends up over the huh. Um, and what I've done from now on, after this slide, is to just transliterate, even though of course it's written in Cyrillic, to just transliterate all the examples with the dots for your convenience. Okay. Um, now the thing is that this diacritic doesn't occur every time Ura appears, of course, and it also doesn't occur every time there's a word shape um, 
that's uh, the environment for he does put it. This is why it's so hard to figure this out. It only occurs occasionally, as if he's kind of remembered to do this every now and then. Um, so this also suggests that maybe he was copying from uh, another manuscript which had the dots, and then occasionally he remembered put them in, or maybe he himself initiated them trying to get a point across. But it actually doesn't really matter whether it was Dobrensha or someone earlier, because I had to deal with uh, why are there dots over here, and that's me. <laughs> so, so here are some other examples, and, uh, and again, this, these are the only places this appears. Obviously, the name Peter shows up a lot in the Gospels, but this is, it's only three times where you see it, the word or you can see that there's nothing semantically that relates these, um, but that um, uh, connects these. Okay, so here's some more examples. So showing you this, do you see any pattern um, in these examples where all of these have the dotted um, ra? A consonant cluster. Okay. There's always a consonant before. Okay. For example, in uh, not a sacrifice dot, there is no dot. I think one, um, there is one. Okay, it's actually over the wrong, but this is case where I put it literally where he put it. Because remember, it's not written with spaces in between. So I just kind of got it over a couple letters. So it should actually be over the wrong. Right. Okay, yeah. That there's always a consonant cluster, and it could be more than two consonants on one side and another consonant. The other, okay, right, and um, okay, and not only that, but what else in the word shape besides that, or in the no, syllable shape? So, yeah, the reduced vowel. Now, the thing is, the reduced vowel. Uh, there were two reduced vowels, one front and one back. Doesn't make any difference here which one it is. Okay, the, the front one is this, the back one is this, but you can see it doesn't matter. Right, so you would have consonant, ra, um, reduced vowel, another consonant, okay. And these are all correct Old Church Slavonic spellings, they're canonical Old Church Slavonic spellings, but someone is putting a dot here to try to tell us something else, okay, or something additional to that. But they're all spelled correctly um, in, from Old Church Slavonic, and so well, Church Slavonic was um, basically its heyday was around 860 to 1100. Um, it's important to know that Old Church Slavonic was an invented language, as it was a written language really only, except it was also chanted. These um, uh, these lections were read aloud, but no one actually went around speaking it. Okay, it was an Esperanto for Slavs that was invented by Saint Cyril, who. Um, was a, and his brother Methodius, but Methodius actually didn't invent the language. Um, Cyril was a um, professor of Semitic languages. And um, he, um, and actually the first Slavic alphabet he created was kind of based more on, on um, uh, alphabets of, of Semitic languages. Then later it became based on the Greek, a completely different alphabet, this one which is based on, the, on Greek letters. But in any event, so his goal was to try to have a standard version of Slavic that everyone, despite their different dialects, could understand. And um, in all church Slavonic, in these forms, the reduced vowel always follows the vr. Okay? <coughs> well, actually, in Proto-Slavic and or common Slavic, and, and generally Old Church Slavonic reflects the late um, common Slavic period. Nevertheless, because it overlapped with it, nevertheless, there is a big difference that historically, these forms that are spelled this way in Old Church Slavonic either were like this, either one of the uh, reduced vowels, or they were like this. But they both got merged to, to this version in Old Church Slavonic, which means that they're that was kind of an artificial thing because in, um, uh, as the different uh, vernacular language groups developed, they kind of did different things with this, but all church Slavonic, all of them are like that. That means that it is very likely not reflecting the way that a lot of people dealing with these manuscripts actually spoke. Um, most, especially because most of these roots were of this type in, um, in Proto-Slavic. This was just a minority of, of um, roots. So 
Verbs will be pronounced like crook, I guess, if we need a consonant, C for consonant, would be pronounced crook in Vulture Salon. Right? Um, okay. And how we know that there are these differences is we can look to early East Slavic manuscripts um, which preserve this system, but they just lower the front vowel to, I'm sorry, lower the either one of the reduced vowels to a full vowel. So they don't do what Ultra Slavonic, which was a South Slavic um, language, do. By collapsing them, they actually kept this distinction. But in South Slavic, what happened after um, uh, the late common Slavic period is that they just omitted all of these reduced vowels entirely. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to give you a minor motion there. So that you ended up with a syllabic liquid or some sort of a little tiny vowel, right, or tone on one side or the other. Yeah. Is that both of them or just the one both. where the vowel preceded the Both, both. Both. Yeah. So they both merged into this type, at least this is generally believed, looking at um, uh, particularly like Serbian manuscripts and looking at modern um, Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, where you have like place names like Srebrenica and Prstis, Pers and I don't pronounce these very well, but I, I have heard people who are native speakers pronounce them where you really don't seem to hear a vowel, though I'm sure there is one on one side or the other. The point is that, speak, that people can't really tell without acoustical equipment which side it's on or whether, you know, it's always, whether it depends on the speaker or not. Then later, kind of, uh, develop further in different South Slavic languages so that Bulgarian does not have this, these Slavic liquids, Macedonian does, and so does Serbian. That's another way of being able to tell if the manuscript has Macedonian or Serbian dialect features. Um, okay. And so the period of Proto-Slavic that Old Church Slavonic generally reflected, again, was late Common Slavic, which was spoken in three major dialects. There were no like, Slavic languages yet during the same period as Old Church Slavonic. And these were South Slavic, East Slavic, and West Slavic, although there were a lot of like, sub-dialects in there, but there were no actual Slavic languages yet. And the reason why I went through all these changes to this, okay, either uh, particularly switching, doing the metathesis here, is because common Slavic by then had undergone an open syllable rule so that syllables could no longer end in a consonant. Even though by the time Ultra Slavonic, I'm going to say OCS because that's what we call it, okay, um, was invented, the reduced vowels were already being dropped at word end and in some other positions because they were short, sort of like the like E at the end of the word or the at the end of the word in English got dropped. So that those words now did end in a consonant and have a closed syllable, so they did start getting away with, with um, having closed syllables again. But in inventing OCS, Cyril opted to metathesize the old root shape to get rid of the consonant cluster at the end of the first syllable. So if you metathesize it, then you can break it up into two syllables. So that's one way of dealing with it. And um, okay. although again, the South Slavic vernacular, which really finished developing in around um, uh, 1100 and then, uh, then was actually officially South Slavic, South Slavic by then, um, treated this um, it, by just getting rid of the reduced vowel, which of course doesn't really leave you, unless you want to treat this as a vowel here, it doesn't really help our open syllable well. Okay. Um, and again, uh, Middle Bulgarian, manuscripts you can find have any of these, I would be pronouncing this as a schwa by now, um, any of these shapes here for um, the um, Kirk um, formation at the top. Uh, so kind of depended where you were in uh, geographically in Bulgaria as to whether you pronounce them the old way, the ultra Slavonic way, or the Macedonian Serbian way um, with the Slavic liquid. Now, contemporary standard Bulgarian um, solves this issue in an entirely different and completely artificial way. So first, the reduced vowel, which has become this kind of schwa sound, 
um, has stayed, okay, haven't gotten rid of it, but what they do is they have a rule about how if you have a vowel following, then you have the, um, uh, then you have this position, okay, for all of these words, regardless of whether they were crook or crook originally, if it's a word end or a consonant as long, you have crook, okay? So there's a whole issue about underlying root forms for this, and generally you don't try to get an underlying root form. But again, this is kind of an artificial standard that was passed because none of the uh, dialects actually did this by themselves. So <laughs> that's what you're supposed to do. And, it's orthographic in this. Yes, yes. Well, well, not even orthographic, but the way you're supposed to pronounce it. So yeah. So here, for example, Durzha okay, um, means I hold. But, and drush is the imperative hold. Okay? So you have both forms of this in the same verb, and you don't want to try to say, well, one of these is the, um, uh, is the underlying form, because we know, actually, that there's no, there's no basis on which to decide that one is rather than the other, and historically, there's certainly no basis, because they both that rule is completely made up. Okay. Um, so Bulgarian regional dialects now reflect the more of the middle Bulgarian vernacular situation. Um, so similarly, Old Church Slavonic also had roots with the shape um, uh, consonant l, reduced vowel consonant, which derives similarly from these same types of shapes, either kolk or klut, okay? And here on from now on, I'm just going to indicate either reduced vowel with the back um, reduced vowel uh, symbol. Um, so here we have blucho, I am silent. Um, later in South Slavic, both of these shapes also merged into a single form with a syllabic liquid. Um, and the interesting thing about the Debrecia Gospel is it never puts a diacritic over the L in these Church Slavonic spellings. It's only the R. Um, and so uh, and we have to wonder why that is. And it's probably because of this orthographic asymmetry between the R and the L that the original editor of the manuscript, the Bulgarian linguist Vinyotsana, didn't even remark on these dots and didn't recognize that they meant anything when they were over the R. So then the question is, what is um, going on in the manuscript? If the manuscript is later than the period where we have this, so we can expect if it's a Bulgarian manuscript, um, it may not have a syllabic liquid. Um, certainly the scribe was trying to spell this as Old Church Slavonic with the whole way, but interestingly, he didn't ever put a dot over the L, the other liquid where we have these shapes, okay? So, but occasionally, again, even more sporadically, the Old Church Slavonic cluck formula is written as cluck, okay? So we have six instances of um, mole or ultra slavonic bluff, which kind of suggests someone's dialect has mole here. But this never happens with the rough forms. They're never spelled with the uh, reduced vowel preceding the rough. That only happens when it's an, an L. Okay? Um, so then the question is, again, why the difference between the two? So Sonos' introduction to his first edition of the manuscript obscures the issue of the distribution between the dotted or acute accented letter C and the spellings with the um, uh, with the with the uh, reduced vowel preceding the L in the manuscripts uh, because he doesn't distinguish between the ultras Slavonic spellings with the dotted C the occasional Kolk spellings for OCS Kluck, and a few spellings where the reduced vowel is written both before and after the liquid consonant letter for both of these um, liquid consonants. Um, and seven of the forms in his list of what he claims are Kirk or Kolk spellings actually have the spelling Kurut Kuluk in the manuscript. But he's just treated these as if they're cold. And, and then he's wrong, of course, to say that these are Kurt spellings because we don't have a single example of Kurt in the manuscript. We just have very 
rarely could it. Okay. We do have cults, but we don't have that. So, um, and so why he treated the spellings with a superfluous reduced vowel letter as the same thing as um, Kirk or Kolk is a mystery to me. But unfortunately, a number of other linguists not dealing with the actual manuscript, but reading Sonos, relying on Sonos introduction, have kind of run with this. And they think that that's including uh, the Macedonian uh, linguist Blaja Konetsky, um, who then kind of repeated this and even argued it was a Macedonianism in the manuscript because they didn't know that, um, uh, that Sonos had gotten that wrong. Um, now this form, so this form here, which you can see a couple times here, which looks really strange for South Slavic language, you can actually find in some early East Slavic manuscripts from the Novgorod area because it does reflect dialect pronunciation there, where kind of well, you know, we'll just put, we'll just divide this up into syllables by. Uh, Stick, sticking in reduced vowel either way, so you get an extra solo. Um, the reason why Islamic did that is because it also did that with other uh, with similar uh, roots that had full vowels there. So it's very common in early Islamic writings, which are early Slavic is pre precursors to Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian, um, and it reflects, of course, how these forms really were pronounced in Novgorod. But that doesn't mean that anyone pronounced them that way in South Slav. Um, but Sonif argues that in these superfluous reduced vowel letter spellings, in the Debrecia Gospel, the scribe was preserving the altered Slavonic spelling of the reduced vowel after the liquid consonant letter, while at the same time deliberately inserting another reduced vowel letter before the consonant in order to reflect his own Middle Bulgarian uh, dialect pronunciation. But if this is deliberate, then you have to wonder why these spellings only show up a very few times. It seems that these are actually inadvertent spellings. Um, they may be reflecting dialect, um, may just be reflecting confusion. Although there shouldn't be any confusion because Debrecia knows that these are supposed to be spelled with just one reduced spell following the liquid consonant, and he usually does that. So, I'll tell you what I think. I think instead that either priest of ratio or a predecessor of his, because again, it could be the features of his copying source, was striving throughout to produce the canonical OCS spellings, regardless of how he actually pronounced these words, and to suppress orthographic expression of the cult, uh, sorry, the cult feature in his vernacular dialect, which probably did have cult, maybe not could have, but did have cult. But, that the dialect feature occasionally crept in nevertheless, which is quite common in these kinds of manuscripts. And where it um, tended to, where it tended to occur um, when it crept in was either in a superfluous second um, uh, reduced vowel in Kolok, which we have three times, or in Kolk instead of OCS Kluk, which we have 30 times. Although 30, actually, when you see the size of the manuscript, is not a lot, but nevertheless, the difference between 30 and 3. Okay. But then, so, but then what about this? Okay, so maybe it is that the scribe's dialect, or some scribe's dialect, did have cult. Okay. Um, but how come we have this form when we never have Kirk spelled uh, in the manuscript? There are four occurrences of this versus many, a lot more than 30, um, dotted. Bars. Um, and so these are difficult to explain as failures to suppress a turf, uh, sorry, a kirk, normally we call them turfs in, um, uh, in Slavic linguistics because t stands for consonant, though nobody knows why. Um, so that's why I've been saying kirk instead, but I feel like I get confused. So it's hard to explain these as failures to suppress a kirk dialect feature because we have no unambiguous kirk spellings to suggest that we ever had that kind of dialect feature um, uh, that, the scri that any of the scribes ever had that. Um, so it seems as if it's not, this is not likely to be a suppressed kirk dialect form because we don't see this the way we do with, with the cult forms in the duration of the gospel. So at this point, field recordings of modern Bulgarian dialects, and there are lots of um, different modern Bulgarian dialects may help here. Although it's important to keep in mind when you do this and you look at, um, at modern uh, 
dialects that not all features of modern Bulgarian dialects date back to the middle Bulgarian uh, era, of course. But if we keep that in mind, if we take a brief look at manuscripts of various spelling variants from the perspective of Bulgarian and Macedonian dialects, it's somewhat instructive with regard to any potential phonological significance of the asymmetry in these um, proto-crook and dotted crook spellings. So taking the um, dotted, uh, let's see, first, the diacritic seems to be representing some non-OCS phonological treatment of the reduced vowel letter. And so then the immediate question is, could the dot be marking a syllabic liquid, as in the earlier general South Slavic dialect, or as in Serbian manuscripts? Well, the Debrecen Gospel does have two instances of syllabic liquid spellings which are features of Macedonian manuscripts, and it does have, as I showed you, the other Macedonian logical feature. Um, and the, this, this uh, form still exists in contemporary standard Macedonian. And of course, Macedonia borders on uh, Western Bulgaria, so with ice glosses, et cetera, no surprise there. But these two forms with no reduced vowel letter in the manuscript just happen to be the way OCS abbreviates these forms, these words, with the teeth well over them. Um, and these both are words that tend to be treated as nomina sacra, even though maybe they semantically not really, but because of the context in which they tend to occur. Okay? Um, and so what would happen is you would expect to see them like this, with just a teeth well over here to show that they're in abbreviation. So it seems much more likely, since there are only two of these apparent syllabic liquid spellings, and that there are these particular words that they were meant as the abbreviated forms of the two words, but that the Debrecho, or an earlier scribe, forgot to add the titlo, which is inserted last after you write the word. And some scribes actually go back and insert them after they write the whole line. So it's pretty, it's not uncommon to have them accidentally inserted. So that might be explaining, um, that certainly seems to explain those, and we can take those two out of the mix. Now looking at the sporadic um, Kolk spellings in the manuscript, um, the Macedonian linguist Koneski, who considered the Dobrecia Gospel wrongly to be Macedonian, uh, partly because he relied on Sonos introduction, which is wrong, um, stated that the reduced vowel letter here preceding the liquid consonant letter in the manuscript reflects a dark vocalic overtone, or presvoke, which I couldn't really translate better than kind of overtone, before the syllabic L. So in other words, Koniski said that the dialect that the spelling represented, the spelling Kolk, had a syllabic liquid but with a very slight vocalization before it that later developed into a full vowel in the vernacular. Um, and so that's why you actually see it spelled as a vowel. Note that modern Macedonian has a syllabic rung, but it doesn't have a syllabic O. Okay? In most of the Slavic languages, the two liquids are treated bit differently. And it's not, the, the fewer of them have the cluck um, form than the number that have the crook form. Um, so, okay, so this sounds good, but it doesn't explain the even more sporadic spelling of uh, cluck in addition to cluck. It explains cluck, but why that? Okay. So, however, the early 20th century Bulgarian linguist uh, Miletic recorded a few Eastern Bulgarian dialects that had a schwa sound both preceding and following a ur. He didn't record any with an, uh, doing that with an L, um, which isn't surprising because, as I suggested just now, there is a general asymmetry between the reflexes of the common Slavic Kirk and Polk formations in modern South Slavic languages and dialects. Um, such as Macedonian and other towns, Slavic, whatever, but not Slavic. Oh, and this is the case for modern Bulgarian uh, dialects also. So he only gave one example okay, of the word um, lazy, which would be Mrzalif in um, uh, contemporary standard Bulgarian, and this is a dialect form of it, Mrzalivitsk. Um, okay. And that being said, the 201 dialect atlas of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences records a syllabic L in some Western Bulgarian dialects, including the Sofia dialects. Um, 
But in, they, they also note that there's more inconsistency in Kolk reflexes than in Kirk reflexes. And also importantly, that a dialect atlas notes an introduction that there are specific roots that are exceptions to the Kolk reflexes. Another Bulgarian linguist, um, Toda Borgiev, writing about Eastern Bulgarian Thracian dialects, said that both Kirk and Kolk reflexes can be word specific. He gave some examples from dialect, Thracian dialects where for Old Church Slavonic uh, uh, um, you get Zhalt, but for Old Church Slavonic Dluk, you get Dlek. It just kind of seems to depend on the root, whether you're going away or not. And you would find in several different dialects these same words showing up um, with, uh, for some reason, in one group or the other. No one's actually sure why. So we're turning again to the dotted C letter in the manuscript. Although, when it occurs, it's usually found in OCS uh, crook spellings. It also occurs occasionally over forms that contain a consonant cluster ending in R that never had a reduced vowel historically. So now we see it in places where we can't actually explain it as well. So while it's possible that one or more of these is just an inadvertent, literally, slip of the pen, because scribes often rested their pen on the page when they went to consult their source so that they would end up with, with these dots that they had intended. It's possible that some of these are like that, but the distribution here indicates that at least the majority of these are deliberate dots. In three of the six OCS forms here that have dental clusters, the tr or dr, okay, later developed into tr or dr, respectively, in contemporary standard Bulgarian without a switch back and forth, okay? Diatr, Durbol, Petr is the name for Peter, okay? So it seems like that's kind of no accident here. This suggests that the diacritic over the letter could see here marks an immediately preceding vocalic element, and that it probably then must also do that in the dotted word C spellings of the OCS crook forms. But we notice we get it with, um, uh, with these various consonant clusters. Then we have this issue with multiple, what look like acute accent marks, although we know that the manuscript doesn't mark for stress. There are four of these instances of, of double or triple acute accents in historical non crook forms. And again, these marks don't correspond to sentence stress or word stress, or even to the location of the word in the sentence, or whether it's the beginning um, uh, sentence in the reading. But there seems to be no pattern there. Like the single diacritics, the double or triple acute accents in these forms appear to be indicating a vocalic element between the first consonant in the cluster and the r. The triple acute accent mark also shows up once in an uh, OCS crook spelling. Okay. Here we go. Actually, I can't fit them in, so actually there of course wouldn't be that space. There would be like three uh, accent marks over the Okay. Um, and this first example up here of triple accent marks over uh, divinity is particularly interesting because this form divinity differs from the accented forms here um, because it doesn't have the ritzi letter at the end of a consonant cluster where this is occurring. Instead, it's dv, right? The, the r is later in the root. So the consonant cluster here is dva, not or zr, et cetera, as where we've normally seen it. But notice that in canonical OCS, this same word has a reduced vowel. It was um, divri, okay. uh, oh, sorry, it was, um, yeah, diverti, diverti, okay, which lowered to a ya, yeah, okay, in, in this position. Um, and uh, you even see it written as diverti in uh, some uh, OCS, one of the uh, canonical OCS um, manuscripts. So, so that's not unusual that it might have a e here, okay? But we know that this e was originally a front vowel because the most conservative OCS manuscripts um, spelled that way in front reduced vowel. Um, so since in the canonical spelling, the OCS vowel letter is a reduced vowel, the OCS form diverti looks very similar to one of those crook formations if you don't actually notice that the r is in a different position there. And in fact, a common Middle Bulgarian dialect 
variant of this word, which shows up in many Bulgarian church uh, Slavonic manu uh, manuscripts, does a metathesis of the reduced vowel and writes it as devri instead of devri. So it means that the metathesis is by analogy to the dialect forms in um, uh, the dialect form kirk or crook. So the triple acutes over the letter v in the Dobrosha Gospel probably are indicating that there is a vocalic segment between the d and the v here, especially since we see this, and in fact this shows up in one of the two uh, most closely related manuscripts to the Dobrosha, which I mentioned earlier. So there's also a single instance of a dot over the letter um, l, or ludia is the name of the letter, in a non cluck consonant cluster. And the dot here again may have been intended to be placed over the initial cluster, kura, right? um, or it could just be an inadvertent resting point. But the consonant cluster here contains an epithetic L. In other words, a L that's added word internally. Um, in late Proto Slavic, any labial consonant that had been followed originally uh, in early Proto Slavic by a front glide across a morpheme boundary got a l inserted between the labial and the glide. So instead of nya, you got nya, etc. And OCS retains the epithetic l as do the East Slavic languages, but in South Slavic and West Slavic, um, this l tends to get dropped. Um, so that it ends up back the way it originally was in earlier uh, common Slavic. Um, that's very characteristic of a South Slavic manuscript. That's how you would know it's not a Russian manuscript, for example. But they would drop the epithetic L and just keep the front glide. Um, the Debrecia di scribes dialect probably didn't retain the epithetic L, which is not unusual for a South Slavic dialect. And this is suggested by the frequent occurrences in it of spelling the same word both with and without an epithetic L, kind of like as if these are. Um, kind of handwriting variants or something, write it with the L sometimes without the L otherwise. So if the scribe's dialect didn't have the cluster bleh, word internally, the dot over this word would be appropriately marking the uh, consonant cluster bleh, as unnatural, okay? Because this is the epithetic L here. So perhaps by analogy to what the scribe was doing elsewhere, that he was indicating some, uh, with the dot that this is an unnatural consonant cluster um, or uh, ordering of the consonant cluster in OCS that may be the analogy, he's doing the same thing here. Um, okay, and let's see. Okay, I think I just showed you that. Okay, yes, all right. So then a related orthographic pattern, the manuscript that sheds some light also on the meaning of the dotted of C in these other forms is a sporadically occurring dotted of C in forms of the OCS noun Archiorde, high priest, which is a borrowing, of course. Um, in contrast to the non um, the non crook forms on the last few slides, where the dotted or accented C letter immediately follows another consonant letter in a cluster in Archiorde, um, the Ritzi is the first letter in the cluster. The cluster is R, okay, uh, which was not natural for a Slavic, which actually didn't uh, have a lot of um, roots that had a K sound in it. Uh, it's hard to pronounce, for one thing. It, it's supposed to be in the same um, uh, syllable. And again, if this is a, supposed to be reflecting an open syllable pronunciation, then it is. It's a Ritzi, okay? Um, and the whole reason why it occurs this way is because the word archaeurgy was borrowed from Greek. So and it's telling that this particular Greek borrowing is often written in other Church Slavonic manuscripts with either a superfluous um, reduced vowel, which obviously Greek didn't have, to kind of break up the syllable as if this is the way it was actually supposed to be spelled, or with a marker called a parodok, which marks a reduced vowel that you are not spelling or usually for space conservation reasons. So this is very typical to see it spelled this way, which is actually considered not canonical OCS, but it looks like that is what this is suggesting here. Um, so, so by using the podoff, or by spelling out a reduced vowel here, other slide, uh, scribes are trying to treat this word as if it were an etymological Slavic word. Um, and again, we don't get this every time we have this word, which appears a lot. These are the different, these are the only places where we have it. 
but it appears to be indicating vocalic element between the two consonants while at the same time preserving the canonical OCS spelling because the, uh, the scribe and probably predecessor scribes were really making an effort to try to spell it in canonical OCS. Okay, so now we figured out that the dot over there, which is C, in OCS crook forms and in other non crook consonant clusters, seems to be marking an awkward consonant cluster by suggesting there should be a vocalic element between the consonants the way this paradox symbol does. So then why not use a paradox instead of a dot then? Okay. Um, because the depression gospel doesn't generally do that. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't tend to drop those uh, reduced vowels and use that symbol, except here in this word and a couple others. So the reason it doesn't use a paradox is that the, and it, the reason why it uses a dot here, I should put it this way, instead of a paradox, because, is because the dot can be found in some Greek manuscripts too, when it is placed over word final consonant clusters in borrowed words. Word final consonant clusters were unnatural in Greek, and so the dot here had the same function as it seems the dot has in the Brescia Gospel to break up this unnatural cluster by suggesting either this is a natural or try to stick some vocalic element in here. And this must not be a coincidence because we know that the um, uh, scribes often consulted Greek manuscripts when they had a problem with their copying source and the scribes generally did read Greek. Um, so that um, the dot convention in the Debrecha Gospel must have been um, adopted from Greek manuscripts. Um, it's not very common in Greek manuscripts, but it has been observed. And the occurrence of a dot over the letter slovo, or s, in the Slavic form psalm in the manuscript offers further evidence that a diacritic above or near the root c letter marks an unnatural consonant cluster. So note that in a canonical OCS, we have a reduced vowel here in the root this, okay? Um, and what happens is that when it's in, um, it's in what's called a weak position here where there's no reduced vowel following, so it's really typical for it to drop and not be spelled because by then it wasn't being pronounced. So if we had a vowel following, as here with the instrumental um, suffix, it would be pronounced psalm. Okay? Um, and even people reading OCS aloud would be doing that. We know that this already that these uh, reduced vowels were already disappearing um, even before the OCS era because um, all the canonical OCS manuscripts occasionally do omit it. Um, even though they're trying not to. So, so the, word, the problem is that the, uh, this formation did not occur historically in Proto-Slavic until you got the loss of the reduced vowel and syllables that were immediately followed by full vowel, but even so, there are not very many that have the combination H huh plus a reduced vowel plus a consonant. There actually is maybe the only word that I can think of on the etymological root in Slavic that is pu, starts with pu, reduced vowel. Um, and so the scribe Dobratia may have perceived a vocalic element between these two instruments, not because it used to be um, in late common Slavic hundreds of years before, but because this just ps just sounds so unnatural. But what's interesting is that in borrowings with the initial cluster ps, such as Psalm, which is not pronounced psalm in um, Slavic, but psalm. Um, he gets around this by using the psi digraph from Greek. That way you don't have to worry about it. But you can't really do that for a Slavic word for dog. It would, no one would really know what this meant. So he has to write, this is one, the only occasion he has to write psa. So it doesn't sound right. So we're going to put the dot over the top. Um, and actually, it's lucky that he didn't circumvent the problem by writing out the reduced um, vowel here, because this single occurrence over the, uh, of the dot over the cluster ps is indirect evidence of the function of the diacritic over the letter ps. So the meaning of the dot or, or acute accent, quote unquote, under the ps in consonant clusters is that uh, it marks a vernacular vocalic element of some sort before the ra, whether it's actually a syllabic ra or not, you can't really tell in consonant clusters, but I will show it this way, as if it's not like even a full reduced vowel, but maybe just a little um, 
vocalic element, which, as uh, Konevsky was suggested. And the reason why the vocalic elements indicated by a diacritic instead of by the reduced vowel letter is probably because Dobratia was really striving to reproduce the OCS spelling, which he knew very well, and he had no interest in replacing it with a phonemic transcription of his vernacular. Although he did want to kind of make little notes to the reader you know, that this looked unnatural. And the reason why a corresponding dot doesn't occur over the letter Rudia in the manuscripts uh, clip spellings likely is that while the dialect that's reflected in the spelling um, was characterized by Kirk forms, um, it had primarily slit forms. Um, with the exception of certain roots, as I showed you before, that we have even in modern Bulgarian dialects that occasionally uh, up here uh, spelled in the math in, uh, as uh, cult, and this would mean that these are occasionally spelled in the manuscript as they were pronounced in the vernacular. So, and that's the onetsa, the end. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>